Hey everyone, and welcome to The Rational Republican, a podcast where we look at complex issues facing us here in Oregon and around the nation. We'll try to address issues from a nonpartisan perspective and view our disagreements through a lens of respect rather than tribalism or divisiveness. I'm James Ball. This is Nick Kurlaski. Hey listeners, how we doing? Today's podcast is brought to you by ProLift Garage Doors. ProLift is your one-stop shop for residential and small commercial garage doors from openers, springs, and rollers to full reinstalls. They offer same-day service on all garage door repairs with no extra charge for evenings or weekends. Serving the greater Portland metro area, call today and set up your free estimate at 503-558-6349 or at proliftdoors.com slash Portland. Again, that's 503-558-6349. 6349 or proliftdoors.com slash Portland. Welcome, YouTube viewers. You're in, for, you're in for a treat. All right. And now on our audacity, Jimbo, can you count us down? Uh, I just start whenever and I'll, I'll mix it up when we, when we get there. All right. Okay. Three, two. I'm recording. Record. All right. All right. So we're recording on audacity. We're recording on Zoom. We're all ready to get this show on the road. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. All right. Listeners and now viewers, welcome to another episode of Rational Republican. This is Nick along with uh, my co-host James Ball. And I'm handling the intro today because we are committing a little bit of podultery. Today we are, are going to be talking to our guests, <laughs> Rohan Galati and Kyle Henson, who are two members of uh, my former podcast, Unnecessary and Proper. Guys, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Great to be here. Happy to be on. I, uh, I'm <clears throat> interested that you chose the, uh, the name for this crossover to be rational and proper, like picking the two best <laughs> things. I was really hoping for unnecessary and Republican, but <laughs> uh, Lord knows we are unnecessary Republicans. <laughs> yeah, Nick, no. thanks for having us on. Um, I, I know I've been sort of wanting to show and I'm glad that I eventually forced my way onto the show. So yeah, absolutely. No, this, this one should be fun. Um, so everybody's kind of familiar with with our perspectives. I, obviously, uh, James and I are, are center right Republicans. Kyle, you I feel like would be comfortably described as a libertarian, maybe a right leaning libertarian. And Rohan, I feel like you you lean to the left, but your allegiance is is always to the law and to the Constitution more than necessarily any politician or political party. Is that yeah, accurate? I describe I describe myself as a as a moderate uh, liberal. I think okay, you've uh, you've tossed oh. around the term bipartisan curious a lot of the time. I, that certainly <laughs> that describes me. Yeah, I like it. Well, we today are uh, James and I are actually going to take a, a little bit of a backseat because the the topic of today is what is the future of the GOP? What is the future of conservatism? And what's what's it going to be like going forward? Uh, you know, especially for people like us. And I know you, Kyle, and you, Rohan, have been. Uh, we've had our our Slack channel for several years now, and there's. A lot of times you guys send me a story about Republicans and I just have to respond with an eye roll emoji because some of it's pretty bad. There's some, there's some stuff out there that's not really right or left policy, but it's good public policy and we can all kind of get behind it. Um, so I, I guess at this point, uh, you know, let, me, let me turn it over to you guys. What, what is interesting to you about what the future of the, the Republican Party is? So I think that when I was thinking about this topic as, as a subject for this podcast or a subject of discussion with in our Slack channel. I, I'm primarily looking at it through the lens of Donald Trump. Obviously, he's lost the election. We all agree on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's obviously a joke. I, I'm not surprised that you guys say we do un, sort of unflinchingly. But of course, we live in an era in which there are a significant number of people who don't believe that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. Um, and so I guess I'll use that as a springboard and, and ask you, um, what, what do you guys see as the future of the GOP, given a, the sort of the percentage of the party that's sort of been Trumpified or, you know, whatever you want to call it, really well, joined this, this movement? So we're, we're typically a, you guys probably know this, but we're an Oregon centric podcast. We talk a lot about Oregon, um, not as much about stuff at the federal level, although we do touch on it occasionally, but I would say there's a very big difference between the Oregon GOP and the national GOP. And so I guess to answer your question, depends on which one you're talking about. Um, article that was sent around in the, in the group chat prior to this, talking about how the demographics of the Republican Party are changing. You know, we, we the GOP, are losing the suburbs, but at the same time, we're gaining kind of this 
um, white working class, um, not usually with a college degree. And so it's just, it's just very, it, it's shifting from where it was 15 years ago. Um, we're seeing some of those trends in Oregon as well, but I think what you, you're going to have a different solution. Because like at, at the federal level, you've got the Electoral College, you've got this uh, sort of bias toward smaller states who can have an outsized vote at the federal level. In Oregon, we don't have that. And so we, we really just kind of have to, it, in Oregon, it's, it's 50%. We have to get 50% of the vote to win a statewide election, whereas nationally, you can, you can get by with 45. You know, Trump, if he had, and I know this is kind of a, a controversial topic, but depending on how you look at it, it was a very close election. You know, 40,000 votes in four different st swing states swung this election. Um, and so, I mean, you look at it from a popular standpoint and, and Trump lost by 5 million votes, but from electoral college, it was very close. So Republicans at the national level only need to win 40,000 votes on the margins in key states, whereas Oregon's in, or, uh, Republicans in Oregon need to win 150,000 votes across the state. So um, what, what was the question of how do we see it going forward? I forget yeah, I mean, where, I, think, where I was going with that. So I, I guess I'll, I'll reiterate the question and also kind of respond to what you said. I think that there is a significant portion of the Republican Party or people who are self-identified Republicans who don't really maybe agree with you guys on a lot of issues, a lot of, sort of maybe traditional conservative issues. Um, to us. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Um, and um, so I guess I, I, my question might be then, how do you deal with that dissonance? Obviously, parties are big tents. They're not just, they can't just be ideological sort of, um, I don't know, bunkers, um, but islands. But there does come a point, I think, when that tent becomes too big. It can't, you can't have people who mm -hmm. are, you know, both, uh, I don't know, in favor of pardoning war criminals and not. I mean, I, I, I have a specific subject today, in mind. Like, like, yeah. That just happened this yeah. morning. Uh, you know, there are there are sort of I think breaking points where you say this isn't you, you cannot coexist. Well, I think so I, think, I that, think that that's I think that you're right, Rohan, and I think that there's for me at least from where I sit, I think there is a difference between the direction that the GOP has moved and who Donald Trump is and what he would do were he to to stay in power and then let Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. whatever run, which I God forbid. What I will, I, I, a lot of our regular listeners on the right will give Jimbo and I a hard time because we are, you know, we're not conservative enough or we're not MAGA enough or anything like that because we, we dunk on the soon to be former president a pretty good amount and I think deservedly so. I will say there's one thing about the Trump presidency uh, that I've really liked and that I think is a great path forward for the GOP. I think we are, we are becoming a more populist party. I think the world is becoming more populist. And I think that if we, yeah, let's abandon Trumpism, let's abandon denying of science, let's abandon not listening to medical experts, let's abandon lying to people just overtly. But if we can keep a focus on, to James, to your point, blue collar workers, folks without a college degree, a lot of the, the a lot of the individuals that may, you know, may, may have been Reagan Democrats, but now look around and see, you know, fellow Democrats lighting cities on fire or, you know, focusing on how many different pronouns there are, you know, I, I, whatever things the far left is worried about. I think that there's a, a super good way forward. And it, this, the same article that was mentioned, I, it was a guy, I think Tim Miller wrote it for the Bulwark about red dogs. And I, listeners can go Google that. But, you know, one of the points he he makes is that, well, there's just, you know, there's, there's never going to be a way forward for the GOP to win a national election or to, to win a vote, to win the national vote, to not just be able to count on the electoral college. And I don't think that's true. I think there's plenty of folks who are center right who would look at something that uh, a focus on, you know, Mike Rowe, dirty jobs type of voters like that, something like that. That's a great path forward for the GOP. If we get rid of all the stupid, you know, get rid of like anti-gay things, get rid of anti-environment things, whatever. But if you can focus on some of the good things that have come since the Trump presidency kind of enveloped all of what's been swirling around in GOP dumb for the last 20 or 30 years, I think there's a viable path forward. Well, I think but that wait, works so at the federal level. 
um, but I don't think it works in Oregon. I don't think there's enough of those people in Oregon to make it work. And, and that's kind of one of my point I was making is that it's, it's, a, it's different. You know, you, when you lose an election by 40,000 votes, all you need to do is rile up the base and get people a little bit more energetic and get them to come out and, and turn out more. Basically, I think the, the strategy at the RNC level is double down on what we've been doing just do it harder and make sure that people are more likely to come out. And that, and that includes all of the Trumpy stuff that you're talking about. And that scares me by the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and me so, too. Like you, you flip that to Oregon and there's not enough of those blue collar folks in Oregon to make that a viable strategy. We tried that. We get 40% of the vote pretty consistently. So in Oregon, I, I'm with you, Nick. I think that that is, Oh, well, of course, I mean, that uh, uh, very much aligns with our, you know, beliefs and perspectives of, you know, dump the anti-gay stuff, dump the, you know, uh, the lying to people, the, the craziness of the Trump campaign. Um, Cause I think what you do in Oregon is you can start winning back those, uh, those suburban voters. I think that's who we're talking about really is of, of the, well, by the article, the, the red dog um, Republican, red dog Democrats uh, are, are the suburban folks. And they're the ones who are, fiscally conservative who just don't want to pay a ton of taxes they want to be left alone uh kind of very similar to nick and my um stance on things yeah but so that kind of dovetails into what i was going to ask right is sort of if you get rid of anti-environmentalism get rid of kind of anti-gay stuff I, i'd imagine uh maybe get rid of anti-abortion stuff as well trust science i mean the, a lot of these talking points that you're kind of bringing up are basically saying capitulate to the democratic party on a whole lot of issues that do actually energize and galvanize that part of the at least national base. Like, I, I don't know that there is a way for the GOP to be like, hey, you know what? Yes, we're still super populist. But on the other hand, you know, actually getting rid of a lot of the issues when you kind of add those maybe five things together, right? You're getting rid of a lot of these sort of identitarian issues that end up making the GOP feel like a more populist party. Um, and I mean, I get that there's sort of low taxes is maybe the one vein of connecting policy that you can actually draw a through line from the Mitt Romney GOP to the Donald Trump GOP. I mean, that's kind of it, right? But the rest of the kind of bread and butter GOP issues that I used to identify with back when I was a Republican, like limited government, like a checked executive, um, you know, th those, those issues are like deficit spending, for instance, th those issues are, are gone from the, the GOP and not anywhere else either. Yeah. So the Democrats it, don't do that either. <laughs> yeah, no, they Nobody, don't. Nobody so, no, no one cares about limited government. Anymore. I have, I have strong thoughts on deficit spending, but I won't, I won't. I'm not. A, I'm. I'm not well, an MMT. I'm not a. I know. Not an MMT. I knew Nick news. was gonna say that. Uh, no, I know. Not. But anyway, forget so about. I, but anyway, but hang on. Just so the point though is like I don't know that the national GOP can actually remain a populist party while basically becoming an identitarian, like like basically while identifying with so many of the left's cultural issues. So I don't. I don't think that that's. Begging the question, I think that you're right, that right now there are uh, a good amount of folks in, in our party, in the Republican Party, who are motivated by, you know, screw the environment. We would, you know, they, I guess they wouldn't say it that way, but they'd say, yeah, like, we need Exxon <laughs> to continue to be able to do their thing. They're definitely motivated by social issues. If you're still, you know, gay marriage has been legal for six years nationally now, and I a lot longer in a lot of different states. If you're still motivated by that, okay, whatever. But what I'd ask is who in the GOP is motivated by those things? It, to, to my mind, it's a lot of the older voters, a lot of the more traditional voters, a lot of the voters who are like me, I'm, I absolutely can't get behind stuff like that. And I think there's enough of the 30, 40, 50 year old critical mass of Republican folks who are, even if that is what one or two of the things that you are motivated by, I think you'd be willing to, to get over that to actually win elections. If it comes a choice between, hey, we have to pass a bill that enacts some kind of carbon tax or some kind of environmental protection or has some kind of comprehensive sex ed for schools or something like that, even if that's a thing that you 100% cannot get behind, you still, you'd rather have President Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz or Larry Hogan and do something like that than have President Elizabeth Warren and get absolutely nothing of the types of things that you want. But I don't I think, think that's you, the trade-off, Nick. I mean, we didn't vote for Donald Trump, but we also didn't vote for Joe Biden, right? 
I mean, we just decided to write in candidates. So I, I don't know that it's like, you know, these people are going to pick Holly over Warren, right? I, I think they might stay home. They might vote for a third party. They might write someone in. It, 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 enthusiasm matters. It's not just a this or that, right? Yeah, but I think yeah. that's I, I think that's a thing is if you can get if you can say we can actually do this, we can actually win, we're not gonna be, you know, shoved up against a wall and you know, kind of like Donald Trump had to thread a needle and I I 300 three hundred ele- three hundred four electoral votes, except it was eighty thousand some odd votes in across Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I mean, James, you just pointed out this twenty twenty election was close. Twenty sixteen was really close too, and you flip, you know. 16 neighborhoods in each of those three states and we have president hillary clinton and i think if you can get people convinced that we can we can get back in congress we can kind of maintain our grip on some of the senate seats we can uh work towards a a far more likely electoral college victory i think that that's something that people can get excited about i guess here's why i disagree though is because you're sort of saying if only the GOP nationally agreed with me, we could win nationally. And <laughs> well, I, duh, I guess, of course that's true. I mean, <laughs> but I guess I, I think you might just be seeing it through Rose's Nick tinted glasses. I mean, I, I, yeah, I guess I don't know that the GOP will actually abandon that populism. And you saw a lot of the people who had that like set of views, the Jeff Flakes of the world, the Paul Ryans of the world. I mean, they've got pushed it's, out. It's, it's very. It's I don't know if they're going to push back. I, it's a lot easier if you're only looking at 40,000 votes in the nation to flip an election. It's a lot easier to just take what you're doing, double down, get more people to turn out. I mean, this is historically high turnout, but it's still only what high 80s. So that means one in 10 people just still didn't show up to vote. So if you get low 90s next time by doubling down, by making it that much more, um, that much more crazy <laughs> to get people excited and to come out, you win the election. Um, that is a lot easier path for the RNC than flipping your whole platform around. And like I said, this, this is why I think, this is why I'm really excited about Oregon is because that strategy doesn't work in Oregon. We cannot do that here. We don't have enough voters. And so to Nick's point, like I would love to see a change in the platform in a way that can reach out to more different demographics and different types of people who traditionally vote Democrat. That might work here in, in Oregon. It's not gonna work nationally. So what, what we can do is make that case that says, hey, do you guys want to win elections? This is how you do it. We need to reach out to this group, that group, and the other group. And these are the things we need to change. Oh, and you like far right conservatives who care about abortion and gay rights and these things. Um, we need you to just come along. We need, we need you to vote for us anyway. Um, make sure you're still coming out to vote. So that, that's kind of the needle you have to thread here in Oregon is getting, that, getting the, the, the hyper conservatives to still vote for a moderate candidate and be excited about it. I think this is something that uh, Nick, you dealt with on the on the new Bueller campaign. Is you, I think you mentioned one time that there were a, you got letters from people that would say, "I would give him money if only he wasn't pro-choice." If it was the abortion issue, right? We got. I mean, letters. correct me. Yeah, you did, does yeah. literally dozens of letters every single day. That's I will not vote for a. It was always pro-choice because Newt was pro-choice. There was never any, I think I, well, not let any, there was one. I got exactly one letter where a person said, I would donate if Newt did not support marriage equality or, you know, the gay agenda or why, you know, however this right. person phrased it. Right. But the thing is- I was going to say, I would be surprised if they said marriage equality. Yeah, right. It's like, <laughs> right. it's a very forward-thinking term. Like, yeah. I'm a very backwards person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm I, against marriage equality. <laughs> but I, so I, James, I think you're absolutely right in that in that specific point, we I, we got a ton of loathing letters from people who were pro-life and just could not stomach Newt's pro-choice stance. I think the salient detail is Newt still got a ton of votes. He still had uh, he had he had more money than any gubernatorial candidate in Oregon history, including Kate Brown, who beat him in that election. He had twenty million dollars. Well, most expensive race up to that point was like three million dollars or something like that. So I. I think it's, I, maybe I am being too rose colored. I, maybe y'all are being too, I, whatever gray, whatever the opposite of rose colored is. Um, but I, I do believe if you put something out there that is winning, people will follow. And I think what's more, I don't, I mean, we're having this conversation among the four of us. I, you don't put it in front of somebody to say, hey, I need you to be less conservative or hey, I need you to be less passionate about the thing that you are supremely passionate about. And James, you and I have had this conversation and I like, I think it, I think I am the type of con, like a real actual conservative. The Donald Trump MAGA people are not real type 
conservative. No, they're not. They're not conservative. They yeah, don't yeah. believe in limited government, you know, or any, you know, it, reigning in executive overreach. I mean, Trump is not a conservative, and that's why it was interesting in the beginning. I think we we called the topic of this sort of show being the future of the GOP and the future of conservatism. Uh, those are v- very separate things. I mean, I really think that there are moderate Democrats in the in the suburbs that Joe Biden won that hold more sort of traditional conservative views, maybe on taxation, government spending, um, guns, uh, probably free trade, guns, maybe foreign policy. Um, those people, which I think are a lot more um, conservative in their beliefs, at least, even if they wouldn't call themselves conservative, um, maybe they do, uh, than, than the sort of the MAGA coalition. But I really, I, I've, the thing that I'm concerned about is I really see the MAGA coalition as being this, the strategy that the RNC and, and nationally, I know, I, I, I mean, I, I take your point, James, about, um, about sort of how these parties work uh, on a local state level, state and local level. But nationally, I think there's just been, been this tendency to just they follow Trump really blindly. I do think continue to set the tone for the party, even after he's out of office. Um, Although, I mean, not, maybe, hopefully not, but I really do think he will. Well, um, if he runs in 2024, will, yeah. then at the very least, two years from now, we're talking about him again, even if right. he doesn't get the nomination. I mean, I, I just don't I see a universe will. in which he goes away. You, do you, th- you think he will, James? Oh, I think he'll get to, yeah. I, I think if he decides to run in 2024, which I think he probably will, um, unless he has, you know, health problems between now and then, because that's four years away, he'll be 78 years old. Um, He's going to try to, he's going to stay relevant for, for a couple of years through Twitter and through whatever America first network that he starts. Uh, and then I think he'll win the, the nomination. I think there are, and this is sort of being a, a little bit of a party insider. I, there is a huge Trump following uh, among the GOP. It's, it's, I think we've talked about this at the national level, why people like Lindsey Graham, who were initially very skeptical of Trump, who just kind of flipped. Uh, and became biggest supporters, it's mm-hmm. because of the base. It's because this this group of, I would say, more than half of Republicans who are very, very excited about Trump. And it, you, if you stay as a, as a never Trumper, especially in like that position, mm-hmm. you're, uh, you're going to get primaried, you're going to get things thrown at you, you're going to lose your base, you're going to lose your job. So um, I, think, I think Trump's going to stay relevant, and I think he wins the nomination in 2024. And I think he uh, then loses the general again. That's so my, do you want to hear my crazy simple. conspiracy theory that, uh, that Go for posits it. a bit of an alternative universe? Go All for right. it. <clears throat> so I think, uh, I think Paul Ryan is going to re-enter the national stage. Um, I already know this is going to be 100% wish casting, by the way. If <laughs> Kyle Henson mentioning Paul Ryan, it's going to be wish casting. But please proceed. Right. Fair, fair. It is. But however, Wisconsin has a vacant Senate seat coming up in 2022. Right. Uh, I forget the name of the incumbent who's just Ron retiring. Johnson. Ron, Ron Johnson. Johnson. Yep. Yeah. Ron Johnson's not seeking another term in 2022. I think Paul Ryan is going to run for that seat in 2022 and then seek his party's nomination in 2024. We always knew that he had presidential ambitions when he was Speaker of the House, saw the Trump thing coming, stayed on for two years to pass tax reform, which was his big thing, which he actually did, and then wanted nothing to do with the rest of you know, Trump's term in office. And I think he was really hoping that Biden would win, which would then create a Republican favored midterm environment. He could win based on his general opposition to Trump with the exception of passing tax reform. He could actually speak publicly about how, you know, supporting tax reform and basically for two years being Speaker of the House, how that was just sort of a deal with the devil he had to make because he didn't think Trump was going to win in 2016. So he thought he would be the Republican kind of leader of the House against Hillary Clinton. And then when that wasn't the case, how he just kind of got out of there because he didn't see a future for himself in Trump's GOP, but he wants to be the standard bearer for that alternative universe. I think he's very well positioned to do that. He doesn't have the kind of Mitt Romney branding up for from the Trump base, right, where they hate Mitt Romney because he's, you know, a rhino, right, Republican in name only, right? He, he actually kind of walked away keeping some keeping some favor uh, among Trump supporters even, but among the GOP at large. And I I think that he's really well positioned to actually take the GOP or at least try to take the GOP in that other direction. Well, I think he's also beat Trump in a a primary. And I I don't don't think think, anyone does. No, uh, Trump's got, I mean, his his approval rating among Republicans was like 80% or something. I think it's north of 90. Yeah. And unless something crazy happens in the next four years, 
you know, maybe that dwindles a little bit to 70%, but Hey, guess what? 70% still wins your primary. So it's true. Um, <laughs> the other, the other option is Trump could get thrown in jail. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, so, I, I, I don't think it's Biden's possible. Do it. It's possible. I, I think the, I think, I don't think Biden's going to do it. I think Southern district of New York. Well, that's still I, federal, but there's Chuck state. Rhodes. Any billions fans out there? Chuck yeah, Rhodes going Chuck after Rhodes, Donald yeah. Trump. Uh, um, I think a more realistic third option is Donald Trump says being a TV mogul is really great. I think he either takes over OAN or Newsmax or something like that, or starts, you know, MAGA.tv or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And he realizes. Does anybody have he's, that? Do we, can we jump on <laughs> MAGA.tv? Yeah, exactly. Somebody go get the URL right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he realizes making eight figures every year and living in this echo chamber where you're surrounded by sycophants is, is pretty awesome. You don't have to deal with New York Times critics lambasting you for everything. You don't have to deal with any, you know, crazy hippie liberal senator like Amy Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg, you know, I'd, all these different malicious characters on the left. Those people don't exist in Donald Noted Trump. hippie Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. I, I think he's going to he's gonna have his own TV network. He's going to be doing his thing and making a ton of money. And I think there's probably going to be a lot of people, uh, admittedly, certainly still watching it uh, on, on the GOP side. But if if they lean into the populism thing, then that I that dovetails with where I want the party to go anyway. I think he I think if Trump tries to do that, he loses his base or at least portions of it, because his whole persona is winning. And, you know, he can claim that this election was stolen and he won anyway. But then if he doesn't run again in 2024, he's he's no longer a winner. Now he's a quitter. And I think that he he loses that that base. I think that that's what, that's what a lot, I, I've been racking my brain for years trying to figure out what the, what, what it is about Trump that makes him so, uh, so great to, to so many Republicans. And I think they were sick of losing. And, you know, you can make an argument that we didn't actually lose. You know, we had Republican presidents for a while, but they always sort of the, the idea from the right has always has been you know, even when we have a Republican president or Republican Congress, they never actually do the things that we want them to do. They're always just kind of either either caving or, or whatever to the Democrats. Can I ask you, can I interject, James? Yeah. I, I, this is, I think this is actually I'm not being impertinent here. Uh, genuinely, what is it that Republicans want to see Congress do? Because I, for, for all, I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, I'm 26. As far as I've known, Republicans basically have done a, a, like, three things when I'm, when I, like, in office, in Congress, <laughs> and it's been cut taxes, um, I don't know, I guess Go you could say start wars right. under Bush, yeah. and I, I don't know, Medicare Part I, D, know. like, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> I mean, no child left behind, Rohan. I think it's, I think it's more the perception of doing something than it is the actual doing of things, and Trump is great at pushing that narrative when he actually does anything. And if he doesn't do something, it's always someone else's fault, you know, build the wall. But then when you Dan actually gets to build the wall, oh, it's Pelosi's fault. You know, never mind that he had a Republican Congress for two years and failed to actually build the wall. Um, but I think it's perception it, that for whatever reason, people have decided that Trump is a winner and Mitt Romney is a loser. And if we want to continue winning as a Republican Party, we need to stick with Trump. But you're so, right. I don't, given I don't that you guys, given that you guys don't, as far as I can tell, really want the party to go in a MAGA direction, would you not see yourself? I understand that Oregon is is a sort of a, its own beast. If you were in a more red state, let's say like the Texas GOP, which I think the head of which recently hinted towards secession, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Alan West. Uh, they, they, it was they Alan talk West, about right? Here too. They talk about it here. They talk about joining Idaho here in Oregon. So <laughs> I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in that. Good old Orida. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> greater, greater Idaho. That's it. Look it up. A greater Idaho. Greater Idaho. Um, so oh, wow. I mean, no. But so so I, I guess my question then is, uh, and and sorry if I if Nick if I interrupted you there. Um, I'm used to it. Do you not do I'm you not see time. yourself? Do you not see yourself? At maybe if the party is going to go in this really kind of a hard right Trumpy direction. Is there ever a point where you would break with the party where you would say, I, I, I'm done with this GOP. It doesn't look like anything I, I want it to be. So, so I, I actually have a good answer for this. I, I was uh, having lunch yesterday with a friend of mine and he asked me, you know, given the way that the, the Republican party is going, would you ever consider running as a Democrat? And my answer, well, and this is, this is state of Oregon specific, maybe not nationally, but there are basically three groups in the democratic party. 
There are minorities, which I am not. There are hardcore environmentalists, which I am also not. And there are union folks. That's it. If you don't fit in one of those three categories, uh, you're not invited to the Democratic Party. Like they'll take your vote, but you have to sit at the kid's table. Like they don't, they'll never vote for you. They'll never, you'll never win a primary. And so even, and, and then as a, what would end up being a pretty moderate Democrat, um, I, I would have no place there. And I so honestly- Not, not in Oregon. In Oregon, right. In Oregon, I, I would you, have no yeah. place in the Democratic It'd be Party. Hmm. It'd look different if you were in Florida or Texas or something like that. To, yeah. to that end, I, a friend of James and I's who actually, who works in policy down in Salem, is uh, he's he's gay even and even that's in his own words that's not enough that's like he doesn't feel at home in the democratic party anymore because he's a white cis male and they're everything else is just way too far to the left of where he is even though he's a center-left guy for me uh, i'm i'm also with james i the answer is no i think that the the direction of the party is like uh the direction a river is flowing I don't necessarily know that I'm going to stop it. I think you can go in, you know, Teddy Roosevelt style and shape where the river is going to flow though. And I think there's definitely, there's a lot of ways that we can do that, especially we, uh, James and I, the, these episodes only ever get a couple hundred listens each. We have two episodes <laughs> that are over a thousand. So it's, I don't want to say we have reach within the party, but we definitely, we, we know a lot of like Republican donors. We know a lot of office holders. We, we have reach in that we are tangential to people with reach, I guess. So in that extent, but I mean. Reach adjacent. Yeah, exactly. Which is, a I've, oh my God, this is would, not, this is PG-13 would, rated, but I'm thinking of that, the scene at the end of the first season of Silicon Valley where they have the middle out discussion. If you guys are, yeah, just for a hunt. I'm know, glad we're recording this for YouTube because that's going to be, listeners, so, I'm not going to talk about it any more than that, but it's it's the funniest three minutes of TV you'll ever watch in your life. I got but, an interesting I, story about I, that. So if I can, can I? There you go. I think there's a lot oh, that can be done in okay. terms of how to actually shape the river. Like, I'm not going to walk up to a MAGA person and tell him he's wrong about every single thing. I'm not going to walk up to a pro-life person. I'm not going to walk up to a pro-business person and, and tell them that they're wrong about all of these things. But I think that there are ways that we can shape good, moderate, for terms of this discussion, public policy and candidates and to put in front of people like that and get them along to where we're going. So I was talking with... Um... Daniel Bonham, who is uh, the deputy minority leader in the Oregon State House. And he was telling me that he, he had a coffee with one of his constituents. They sat for a coffee shop pre-COVID, you know, for about an hour. And when they were done, the constituent was like, hey, wow, I'm so glad. I, like, how in the world do you as a state representative have an hour to take out of your day to talk to me about my problems? And he says, I am in the super minority. Nobody wants to talk to me. I have no say in anything. Uh, he's like, I got all the time in the world to talk to constituents about their problems. So um, when Nick and I say that we have uh, <laughs> are uh, adjacent to um, influential people, it's it's uh, we're we're still pretty minority <laughs> here in the state. So it's like, eh, yeah. Mm. So sorry, just yeah. anecdote. The little. Yeah, I was reminded uh, when talking about whether or not you would kind of go and run for another party. Um, I'm sort of reminded of the famous quote, uh, some, some labor organizer, I believe, said, no, look, I'm not a member of an organized political party, all right? I'm, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think it just, it do, though it does always speak to me about sort of the increasing willingness of the Democratic Party in particular to kind of embrace new and different ways of thinking. Um, Side and, note, it's the Democratic Party, not the Democrat Party. This is one of my pet peeves. Mm. Trump has just made everyone on the like far right change their language and have made it was, it, I don't I didn't I say that. I think it's everyone copies been, it. You didn't say it, Kyle. Yeah. I'm not oh, okay. I, oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm just I just one of my pet peeves that I really have to just get yeah. out on air is that that the word Democrat is not an adjective. Sorry, Kyle. Yeah, all good. Anyway. You're here, well um, said. But uh, you know, I do I do actually think like, for instance, if I ever were to run for national office, it would really be on like a platform of passing a new set of 10 amendments. I'm like, go big or go home, right? Um, and just kind of updating <laughs> the constitution in, in, no, in a series of ways that I think are pretty bipartisan, but actually would be really impactful. And I really don't think that the Republican party would be like the vehicle for such a thing. 
I think there's more opportunity for sort of grassroots optimism about a future in the Democratic Party than there is in the Republican Party. I think that as really more grassroots optimism about the past. Kyle's amendments. Everybody has an amazing haircut. <laughs> is that going to make it on there? Everybody has a beard that's just gorgeous. I, mm. I didn't shave for like three days and this is what I look like. It's not good. <laughs> So I'm actually I, replacing freedom of speech with a uh, haircut. <laughs> What's uh, just for men or something? Yeah. <laughs> so I, mean, I, one of, one of, I, I appreciate one of, where you're coming from, Kyle. I, I definitely think that Republicans have been the party of no for a very long time. And I think when you, when you are that and when your, your first instinct is to jump into something and say, the government cannot do that. I want to run for a position in government to not do that thing that you are looking for. <laughs> It's, we are, you know, we're, the, there's Simpsons cutaways all the time and they, they cut to the Springfield Republican Party headquarters and it's like a castle that's like Dracula-esque and there's Monty Burns and the rich text and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, we are, we're not a, you know, sunshine and flowers and happy stuff party. I think that there's ways around that though. I think that there's ways that you can say, I am for this, this, and this. Rohan, you asked earlier, what do you want to see Republicans in Congress do? Yeah. That's a big difference. And what do you want to see Republicans in Congress stop other people from doing? Right. I think there are things that you can get out there and say, we want to do this. I, infrastructure spending, I think is going to be great. Healthcare reform, I think is going to be great. Immigration reform is going to be great. There's a ton that we can do like before immigration got co-opted and all of us became xenophobes in this party. And it's like, I, which I don't know where that came from, but like we need, we can go back and say, Hey, we can do this and we can do this right. And we can be inclusive as all get out as we're making it happen. I think if you, I mean, it's a, it's a chicken and an egg problem. You can't get a lot of candidates who win, who are saying stuff like that when there's a bunch of MAGA people already, but you also can't get the voters where they need to be. If you don't put forward the right candidates, yeah, there's a supply and demand thing happening here. I exactly. Think. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the issues with just cr like cr creating a more center right GOP is just that a lot of those people will not go back to the GOP while it's sort of dominated by MAGA folks. I, I mean, I think that they're just going to, that they, they've just go are going to be in an unhappy or, you know, maybe sometimes happy marriage with kind of Joe Biden because he's the person who could be not Donald Trump, but also not Bernie Sanders. Right, well, which I feel like was kind of his main appeal, frankly. That. Yeah, here's here's a problem with that. So when I when I ran for state rep, one of the my, my platform was Republican, good governance, but not a Trump guy. My first statement was, I, I'm not a Trump fan in my voters pamphlet statement. So, um, the idea was to try to reach out to those you know moderate Democrats, right leaning Democrats, non affiliated voters, and get the Republican vote and also some moderates and some Democrats. Um, that didn't work. So I got basically the exact same percentage of votes I would have gotten if I had not run a campaign or if I had run as a, as a MAGA guy, um, I got exactly what I was supposed to get. So the, if you want Democrat, like if you want a moderate Republican to win, if you want one of these people who's not a MAGA, who's not a, you know, who is the, the part of, of Republicans that, that we want to see get elected, they need to be, um, they need to be rewarded with votes from the center and from Democrats. And in 2020, I mean, that was obviously a Trump year. So everything's a little bit funny in 2020, but what didn't happen, didn't happen for me. I, I live in a very democratic heavy district. So I was kind of hopeful that, you know, I would, I would get 20% um, of the vote instead of 16, <laughs> but I got 16. So we, we need people with enough name ID or with enough, clout or with enough something to win over some of those moderates because as long as those moderates are voting democratic uh there's there's no point of running a moderate republican you just run a mega guy and you get everybody excited and but this is the chicken and egg thing, thing that nick was right. saying right well right yeah so you you need to, yeah sorry yeah just kind of restating what nick said but no no it's no i, I think what you've described is really it that, that's an interesting dynamic i think maybe I, I mean i don't know the specifics of your of your district i think maybe it sounds like you suffered from running in a, in a general election year. Um, well, that I mean, and, and just also being in a, like a deep down. 70 district probably doesn't yeah. help either. Right. Um, but, but I mean, I think that, yeah, as Nick was saying, this is like, it's, there's no, no moderates in the Republican party are being pushed out or aren't rewarded for being moderates. And so there's no incentive to become a moderate, but then it pushes away people like moderate voters. So you just have this 
this this void, and that's why I think this this article that I had sent around about from, from Tim Miller about red dog Democrats, I think that's a really interesting concept for me, just because you know, Mitt, like Mitt Romney, I think he made a statement saying the party doesn't look like anything uh, sort of it, it resembled when I was growing up. And, and yeah. at what point do you really just say, okay, I'm 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 you know I'm I'm going to be Angus King, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Angus King shouts to Maine. I um, so I don't disagree with that. I I think obviously. Trump or no Trump, which we uh, we don't live in a vacuum. We can't escape the fact that Donald Trump did win. He has obviously kind of hijacked this party. But regardless of him, I the world and the political parties that occupy the world do not exist in a vacuum. We Yes, we've changed over the past 30 years. The Democratic Party has changed, I think, substantially over the past 30 years. And I think, honestly, they're, they're just a couple of years behind us. I think the Democratic Party in 2024 is going to look a lot different than the Democratic Party in 2014 versus 2004. And I think there's going to be just as many center left individuals who are not comfortable with that yep. versus like the James and the Knicks of the world who are not comfortable with where the Republican Party is right now. I do. Well, let's, let's revisit in four years. You guys can, you know, maybe, maybe, <laughs> Kyle, can. maybe Kyle and I will have a podcast. You'll come on and say, Ron, what happened to the Democratic Party? How did you lose so badly? You know? Let me ask you this question. Yeah. I sent you this article. Well, and so this is, what do you think? <laughs> this is an issue. I think we're seeing. Well, I, I think we're seeing this in Oregon. Maybe we'll see it nationally going forward. But um, like I said, when you have a very extreme Republican Party, the Democratic Party doesn't need to reach additional voters. And so we're talking about this. Um, you know, so you, these red dog um, Democrats. They are so frustrated and appalled with Trump that they're voting Democrat and the Democratic Party doesn't need to like they they can stick to their like I said, those three groups that run the Democratic Party here in Oregon. Uh, they don't need to reach out to other voters because they already have a supermajority. They already. Well, I don't know if it's state. Oh, so you're saying in Oregon, they, they not can, in Oregon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. OK, OK. Yes. I think it's different. But yeah. but in Oregon, I think this is why you're why Oregon's been in the news a whole bunch is because you have a very extreme Democratic Party and a very extreme Republican Party. And that is because Republicans are unable to reach new voters and Democrats have decided not to. So they just keep doubling down on their very extreme policies, both sides. I would slightly, I think Republicans in Oregon are unwilling to reach new voters. I think we're bound by a very gerrymandered state, but I think there's also, there's not a ton of folks that really try. <laughs> Your candidacy aside, that's James. Fair. I mean, that's, that's fair. Good, good point. Can I can I ask actually? So I to sort of since you guys are Oregon experts, um, that's stretching it. <laughs> <laughs> fine. Um, certainly, you have much more Oregon expertise than I do, um, uh, which is a pretty low bar. Uh, <laughs> the um, you know I think that to your point about uh, sort of the Republican Party in Oregon, how I, I, I've only seen Oregon in the news recently because of the sort of the. Uh, protests, militia type, mm -hmm. militarized looking yeah, protests. And, that, and that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I see those images on TV and I sort of associate them with right wing groups. I think I'm largely correct in that. Um, they were, because they were protesting. It was, was it depends on which one you're talking about. You, the, the protests that went on all the summer both. were definitely a left wing movement. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. One, no, I'm talking the about the ones that happened a like, few days ago. A few days ago at the Salem Capitol. Yeah, yes. that was, that was, you know, Trump folks. Yep. So, if like if those are the images, you know that that those like if that's the Republican Party and the Republican Party in Oregon it, is unwilling to shed those voters because if it did, they would have nothing left. You know this maybe we're just talking in circles about this chicken and egg problem, but it really like as a Democrat, I am worried about the part the, the direction of the Democratic Party, but I can't ever see myself sort of nationally supporting a Republican when you have those elements that aren't sort of actively rebuked by um, both state and national politicians. And I so, think the state and national politicians were elected by those folks, which is why they have a hard time. Yeah. Or they're donors or they are volunteers. I mean, that's the thing about people who are very um, emotional and very uh, radical is they volunteer and they donate and they will get you elected. So. Which shameless plug, we actually, somebody emailed us like a week ago and said, I'm a, I'm a registered independent. I've been registered as Democrat and Republican at different points in my life, but I think Oregon spends too much money. I, what can I do to get involved? And James and I were just like, 
this is great. This is like exactly what we're hoping for because there's like everybody, you know, especially people like us, like, like me and James, we sit here in Oregon and we kind of complain. It's just like, oh my God, all these crazy people, but nobody does anything about it. Uh, I, Rohan, to your question about, you know, Republicans don't want to shed those voters, even though we obviously have to condemn them and, you know, discuss like how problematic it is to kick in locked doors at the state capitol or whatever the grievance which I, the grievance was legitimate you want to have public input there was a special session going on and like you want yeah, the public to be able commit. to express an opinion but don't commit vandalism in the process exactly yeah all that aside it's like you can't you can't do what you did no you don't want to shed those voters but you do want to put somebody up in a leadership role somebody who can reroute those voters you don't want to enrage people. You don't want to incite violence. You don't want to do that. But you do want to say, hey, here's a productive way that you can channel that passion that you have. And especially it can help us actually win some races. I, those types of people are problematic. They're problematic on both sides. Vandalism oh. is not okay. It, crime is not okay. I, period. Period. Full stop. But th you can channel that passion into a way that meets the ends that they're looking for and accomplishes an electoral goal at the same time if you have good leadership and that's that's what i would look for here in oregon is somebody to stand up and say hey we need we need these same people but just to reroute in a different direction and i would say to be fair um a lot of uh oregon leaders um people i follow on facebook legislators have come out and condemned that those actions so awesome. i i don't know if it's happened at the national level i haven't really been paying attention but shelly bosser davis um uh, Tim Pinope, um <laughs> the, the, the several that come to mind of, of legislators who condemn that action. So um, props to them. So we are actually just about out of time. And so just wait, wait, one Kyle, of things, Kyle had one wait. more thing. Sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, we'll sorry. Go. One yeah, more thing a, and then we'll. An interesting just final point is uh, James, you mentioned like a lot of kind of emotional people on either side. And, and I think, you know, to some degree, I think what, what Trump really exposed is that a lot of what people will support matters less on policy and just more about how you make them feel. And so I've always like wondered if there's a Republican who can just get people on board with like trans rights, for instance, being like, no, this is America. This is the land of opportunity. This is where you go to transcend the conditions of your birth. And what better way to do that than to define your gender and identity to the world? This is where you can achieve your dreams and be whoever you want to be. This is America. Like, if you framed it that way, I really wonder if people on the right would actually get on board because it fits into that, like, idea of American identity and self-determination. Like, well, I think we're also very, very um, sort of shackled to the evangelicals as well. And so speaking as an evangelical, um, there's a lot. It's, it's the, the Judeo-Christian um, Puritanism that... Uh, is going to get in the way of that. And same thing with abortion. Like we, we cannot um, divorce ourselves from the issue of abortion as a Republican Party without ticking off a lot of people. And it, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't know that Republican Party is ever going to be a proponent of trans rights, at least not in that way. I think the the best we can do, at least in the short term, and by short term I mean like the next ten or twenty years, is remove it, remove all the anti-trans stuff from our platforms, remove it from our our uh, just stay silent on the issue at least for a while and then yeah. maybe 20 years from now we can we can switch that but we're so i'll i'll put my rose colored glasses on real quick because i kyle i think you're absolutely right i think there is there is an opportunity for people to have their religion and have their politics and not necessarily have the venn diagram just be a complete circle i do think if you framed it exactly that way we are i'm valuing freedom i'm valuing the choice that an individual makes i'm valuing somebody to do something different than what i necessarily myself would do i think there's absolutely a market for that uh, is there a republican politician who's out there saying that right now no i don't believe there is but is there an opportunity for it absolutely yeah, and I don't, james, just, uh... james just to your <laughs> point about uh, being tethered to the evangelicals i mean who would have thunk that the evangelicals would have supported Trump? I mean, you know, yeah, three marriages, right. uh, makes his money in casinos, uh, you know, supremely yeah, I no unfaithful. Idea. I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I don't see it as a gigantic roadblock if you kind of frame well, the way that you think about this country the correct way. So I've asked, I've asked people about that, of why do you support Trump in spite of all these things? And their answer is always, um, or, w or one of two things. One of them is we're not voting for Jesus Christ that everybody has skeletons in their closet. A classic. I, right, I know. And then number two is it doesn't matter so much what he does. It's about his policies and it's about his 
you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is you it, it is you want him to do. Right. And so those are the two arguments I get from evangelicals. Because you're right, it, we we <laughs> getting into a much different conversation. But I don't I don't think the Republican Party can be the party of morality anymore. I think we have given up that mantle, um, and now it, there's a new morality, and the new morality is trans rights and LGBT rights and um, yeah, uh, yeah. marriage equality, equality, rights, marriage equality. Yeah. It's you know racial equality. That's the new morality. We're we in America. It's no longer Judeo-Christian. I mean, the Republican Party is still clinging to it, but I don't think that that is going to be the national discourse for much longer because evangelicals I think essentially this is going to get in trouble for this but essentially sold their soul to follow Trump yeah so. you know Trump is absolutely a golden calf I mean it's yeah. is it, it's I and Nick to your point about that Venn diagram of religion and politics um, you're quite the optimist I'm a little more cynical much more cynical I really think that on both sides but even Democrats I think Democrats even you know most of us are pretty godless heathens um, <laughs> myself included um, but I do think that we've totally replaced uh, religion with politics. And so on, on the right, you have this merge of religion and politics. On the left, you have a replacement where, uh, where relig- you know, politics is like religion. And that's the, that's the fervor that you see on both the right and the left. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's basically zealous fervor. Um, and and I, that scares me. Uh, but maybe that's a separate topic. On, yeah. on next God week's episodes, episodes of the Rational Speak Theologians. Yeah, so we... As mentioned five minutes ago, we are out yeah. of time. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we like to do when we end an episode is uh, ask people who their who their favorite Republican is. And so if you guys not being exactly Republicans, if you want to uh, replace that with favorite politician, you know we can we'll we'll give you a pass on that. Kyle, no, I'm it. I'm I'm down to pick a Republican. If you couldn't have uh, if you if you didn't uh, figure it out already, based on my kind of wild conspiracy theory about Paul Ryan, <laughs> you know, coming in as the the savior of the Republican Party, uh, I I really like Paul Ryan. I think you know he was a very like kind of fact based, numbers based, wonky in all the right ways kind of uh, leader who really actually stole the hearts of the GOP at a at a time. Um, and for kind of some of the right reasons too, I, I really believe it. It was like limited governance. It was actual sincere concern about overreach and about the expansion of the executive. You know, I don't really think that you saw Ryan then excusing Trump's reliance on the executive orders once it, uh, you know, once they were kind of going in a right wing policy direction. And he showed really significant growth on a lot of his more Ayn Randian tendencies, right? When you had him really come out and say, you know, I really mischaracterized people who are on welfare. These are not people who are trying to game the system. Like these are people trying to make it who need this fundamental assistance. And I was wrong. And I, I've changed and evolved my views on that. Wonky and in I think all the that... right ways was something I had in my Tinder profile when I was single. Just <laughs> I, was I thought you were going to say uh, it's your band name. The way- uh, Oh my God, a wonk in all the right ways. I'm about to put that on my dating app profiles. Oh geez. But anyway, um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I, you know, I really think Paul Ryan, um, you know, when he, he did the right thing during the Trump era, he didn't, uh, he announced that he was leaving about a year in. I mean, he, he sort of made a very unhappy marriage with Trump to get tax reform done and then got out of there because he didn't want to be stained anymore by Trump's kind of dominance of the GOP and, I, I think he's the man for the job if the GOP is going to go back to a party that actually cares about limited government. It's very frustrating to me that more, I mean, it, it takes so much energy and so much money and so much everything of your life to run for office and to win. And then I think that that's part of the reason why we have so many Lindsey Graham's flip-flopping on Trump is because, you know, you don't want to lose your seat. You spend a couple million dollars and a year and a half of your life campaigning you know, why would you give that up? So I, I appreciate um, people who, who, who did that and, and were able to divorce, like uh, leave um, the Trump uh, camp, I guess, and give up that seat in the process. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, um, my, my favorite Republican, I think he's still technically a Republican, is David French. Um, he is a conservative commentator. He once was the president of uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, where I once interned. Um, and I think he's just, he's amazingly consistent on, um, constitutional law, constitutional rights. Um, he himself was a judge advocate general, um, and, and was deployed to Iraq. And I thought he provides a lot of really nice context when it comes to 
American policing and sort of his own experiences in Iraq. So I, I really, sort of, I, I just really admire him. I think he's a very consistent um, thinker, and he, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't agree with him on a lot of uh, cultural issues, but I, I think that he approaches everything with a lot of grace and um, a lot of humility and a lot of consistency, which is um, nice in today's day and age. He's a friend of a friend, actually, and my buddy works also at National Review and really likes him. Cool. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and yeah, I thanks guess for having us. inaugural uh, YouTube attempt. So, yes. uh, a lot it. of firsts on this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, listeners, we will talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the Rational Republican Podcast. Your hosts are James Ball and Nick Perlosky. The show today is brought to you by ProLift Garage Doors of Portland, serving the greater Portland metro area for all your garage door installation and repair needs. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, you can email us at james at jamesaball.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can find our episodes at jamesaball.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts.